Well, that's a great question, Brian. And, uh, you know, I write books and I also write several financial newsletters. So I'm thinking about topics all the time. And there's always one, you know, usually you say, well, all right, this war in Ukraine is a really big deal. Got to cover that. Or implosion, financial implosion in China, really big deal. I got to cover that. Or what's going on in the U.S. with a basically mentally incapacitated president. That's, I don't know, it's unprecedented, but I guess since Woodrow Wilson anyway. Other topics, I could give you a long list, you know, every, uh, maybe the, the end of the dollar's role was a global reserve currency, et cetera. The difficulty now, or two things. Number one, they're all going on at once. Like, you know, any one of those topics would, you know, fill a newsletter or a present or, you know, interview like this, et cetera. It'd be a big topic, a heavy lift, but they're all going on at once. Number two, they're not unrelated. There are all kinds of correlations. The, uh, you know, the, the breakdown and collapse of the global supply chain, which preceded COVID. A lot of people say, well, you know, COVID came along. Of course, it messed up the supply chain. I, in my new book, I sold out. I've got very, very good documentation that shows, no, the supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes. And the war in Ukraine made it worse yet. Yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But but when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're, they're all they're all a big deal. If, if, you know, in terms of tragedy, probably the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these things are going on. Uh, it's interesting because I do have kind of an international following, but there are certain pockets. I mean, there are certain countries where, you know, there's interest in what I do or my books are published in that language, et cetera. So I have a good German following. And of course, the Germans want to know what's going on with energy, Japanese following and so forth. But yeah, the U United States, the number one question question. Of course, every, everyone's concerned about inflation, but there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. It's one of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks, and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have. Take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. So there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So so people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And I use, as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And, and there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. We know that, so first quarter 2022 is done, has been for a while, and the U.S. economy declined 1.6%. That, that number's in the books. We're, the second quarter is done. We don't have the official number. We won't until about 10 more days, the U.S. government will release that. But we have very, very good estimates, particularly from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. They have a kind of a real-time tracker. And as of today, they're saying second quarter down 1.6%. So the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's the rule of thumb. Based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying, I got, I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but we're in a recession right now. There's, there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Kramer, you know, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. You know, there's institutional support. Uh, there's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. So, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets 
on yeah, the back I'm of not a recession. Alone. I mean, I mean that that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Barrett, Jeremy Grantham, you know Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they they run hundreds of billions, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So I mean, Jeremy Grantham did a you know so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a one hundred year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world. You know, nineteen twenty nine U.S. nineteen 19- 89 Japan, 2000 dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and and other asset classes. So yeah, I do. Uh, that that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. 1929, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, October I think 18th or 19th. It was late October 1929. The stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day. It was, you know, it was like 12% one day, 11% the next day. So 23% over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82% from from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June 1932. It started in October 1929. So not quite three years. But that fell 82%. And that happened. So so yeah, we're down. You know, NASDAQ's down. I'll bounce back a little bit in recent days. Down close to 30%. Down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory but that's just the beginning that's not what a full bear market full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that i expect started my career in banking in 1976 and i started i remember my uh, my wife and i used to kid each other she was in advertising i was in banking and the inflation was so bad you'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and and I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. And the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. It had huge behavioral effects. Of course, gold was, you know, going to the moon. There was a lot going on at the time. But, but Brian, you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. 41, uh, actually, it was 1981 before we saw all these numbers. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning. It's like, oh, that had some inflation. In 1981. Yeah, we did. But it had started. I mean, in some ways, it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974, 75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, you know, 70, well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50 in that five year stretch. So you were putting up numbers 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing it to today. But that was, I was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years or is it different than that? But I keep that in mind because the, the 40 year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. Fries are like, wait a second, Jim, you know, it's inflation. You just look at 2022, you know, starting in January, it was kind of like 7%. And then it was, like, oh, it's 8.1, it's 8.6. Now it's 9.1, which is true. That is the series. It is going up. So people extrapolate that. And again, there is this comparison to the 70s. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s. And I'll explain why. But well, I'll explain why right now, because in the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil and Embargo in 1973 as a result of the uh, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, and then the price tripled, but it went from like you know, two dollars to six dollars. Okay, but you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still six dollars. And then it got to 12, and then in 1979 you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20. Oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late 70s for because of those two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called 
cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, a natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the 70s, where you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. I was like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You To get the food, you got to fig, feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. How do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So you have that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s, saying, hey, better, better spend the money fast because it's losing value. And you see that in inflationary expectations and inverted yield curves. And I'll come back to that. That's a really big deal. If you thought inflation was going to run away, as it did in the 70s, yield curves would be steeply sloping and people would be in a frenzy to buy stuff. They're not. And the yield curves are not sloping uh, or upward sloping. They're inverted. They're going down. That tells you that, and we also see this inflationary expectations. Inflationary expectations don't drive inflation here and now. What does is inflation here and inflation here and now can feed on itself. Inflation expectations don't drive it, but they tell you a lot. Their information rates to tell you a lot about what people expect. What the yield curve is telling us, what inflationary expectations are telling us, and other factors are telling us is that yeah, there's inflation now, but the Fed's going to kill it, and they're going to kill it by destroying demand and throwing us into a recession. And here's where it gets interesting because you could flip from this kind of inflation to disinflation or even deflation very quickly, and people are definitely not prepared for that. Well, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, kind of everyday consumers are prepared for it. I'm not sure Wall Street and mainstream economists and policymakers are prepared for it. They're just extrapolating the inflation, saying, well, the Fed's going to kill it. Yeah, they might kill it, but at a price, at a very steep price. And consumers are really bracing for that. So, you know, this even Jay Powell has said the soft landing is a myth. It was not, it's not gonna, there's not going to be a soft landing. It's going to be a hard landing, but that's not priced into markets. The, the markets are kind of pricing in a squishy landing or a soft landing or from the runways. They're not pricing in a really hard landing. And that is what we're going to get.